Depleted uranium anti-armor munitions from the United States are part of the latest military aid package to the Ukraine. Why has the US decided to U-turn on a previous decision to not send depleted uranium shells to the war? Australia and China have resumed high-level dialogue after a gap of nearly three years. How deep is the thaw then between the two countries who do over 200 billion US dollars in annual bilateral trade? Salams, this is Daily Debrief coming to you as always from the wonderful People's Dispatch Studios here in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Dani. And before we go any further on the show, a quick reminder to like and subscribe to People's Dispatch on YouTube. Our first story, it's now official that the United States will supply depleted uranium anti-tank armor for its soon-to-be-deployed M1A1 Abrams main battle tanks in the Ukraine. The war in Europe is, of course, having a profound impact on the global economy. Uh, nowhere is this more so than in the Ukraine itself. But as Prabir Prakashta might tell us up next in this first segment, uh, not quite in the way that the West, specifically that the US and NATO, might have imagined things going when they imposed the wide-ranging sanctions that they did. Let's go across now to Prabir Prakashtha, Editor-in-Chief of NewsClick. Hi Prabir, good to uh, have you back on Daily Debrief. Uh, we're starting uh, off, of course, by talking about these uh, specific anti-tank uh, armor shells. Uh, what do you think prompted the decision to sort of uh, go back on a previous statement saying they will not be provided or, or uh, shipped to the battlefield in Ukraine? Uh, what, what is this U.S. sort of, what sort of message are they sending out now? Well, it's difficult to think about any messaging because, as you know, they have earlier itself used this kind of shells in the Challenger tanks that the, the U.K. had sent. Yes, so this is not something which they have not, as NATO, that they have not supplied to Ukraine. The United States had said earlier they will not uh, send, as you said, uh, depleted uranium uh, armor-piercing uh, rounds for their tanks. So that seemed to have been a decision they had taken earlier. Now they have gone back on it, just as uh, they have gone back on what earlier they had said about cluster munitions. Mm -hmm. If you remember, artillery shells, they had said they will not send cluster munitions and in fact, their argument was, we will not sell cluster munitions to anybody. Uh, right. We have it in our uh, armory, but we won't use it. Henceforth, it was a kind of uh, assurance that the United States had given to its people as well. It's not mm. something only to foreign countries. Mm. But as Biden said, they have run out of uh, shells. So they have no other option but now to give them cluster ammunition. So it's possible that one of the things is that they don't want to denude entirely all their armor piercing shells that they have in their stock, which, as you know, the new Ukraine war has taken a huge toll on their stocks. Mm. And the amount of shells or stocks they can continue to produce or restock is limited because the capacities of the United States to face an industrial war wasn't there because they were really not looking at near what would be called near par opposition. But at countries like Syria, Libya, uh, Afghanistan, etc., right. in which the drone warfare for the time being was enough for them, or if they wanted to make any uh, military use that they had of their own armed forces, then it would be short term. It would not mm. be a long term war against a near peer competitor, which is what Russia is, whether they like it or not. That's what Russia has shown. So possibility is simply that they have run out of their or they're nearing the depletion of their stocks to the okay. extent they feel their own defense needs will then be compromised if there is a any other uh, zone of war. And therefore, they are saying, OK, the depleted uranium shells are there. Let's give them uh, to Ukraine because otherwise we will not be able to stop them. So that could be the simplest, uh, simpler argument rather than thinking that this is really ratcheting up the war, which actually Russia had earlier said that if you start giving depleted uranium missiles, 
you're really ratcheting it up to not to nuclear level, but in that direction. How do you make a distinction between depleted uranium missile shells and you know other possible uh, nuclear escalation? But I think that was a part of it was really rhetoric on Russia's side yeah. because depleted uranium unions uh, ammunition has been used by the United States, for instance, in Iraq, Iraq extensively. And we know the consequences of that. So this is not that I don't think this will be crossing of the nuclear raw Rubicon, mm -hmm. as we might think, because depleted uranium shells are not radioactive, by the way. Yes. Depleted uranium shells are highly poisonous because... Mm. It's very heavy metal, and that stays for a long time in the uh, environment that after its use, and that's very dangerous. That that's what the at least the Iraqi doctors seem to have found. And it also has to be viewed together with the fact that the M1 Abrams uh, main battle tank will also enter the scenario uh, where where uh, these munitions will be used, or the platform on which uh, from which these munitions will be used. Uh, as part of a, a bigger, another billion dollar package of military aid, Prabir? Well, you know, the basic issue of why depleted uranium shells are used is, I think, important to also talk about here. Though people have talked about how, though it is not radioactive, yeah. it is highly poisonous because that's the nature of the heavy metal itself. It doesn't change. It stays in your body for a long time. And it has very adverse consequences. The Iraqi doctors have claimed that the places where this kind of ammunition has been uh, used, it stays in the environment for a very long time. And they have seen very large numbers of deformed birth defects, as well as cancer growth in these areas. And it is not uh, seen to be statistically insignificant. That's the kind of uh, reports that are there. The US and UK who have used this kind of weapons continue to stonewall this. They don't really talk about it, except saying it's not radioactive, which is true. It is not. So that is one part of it. The second part of it is Abram M1 tanks. You see, there are no wonder weapons that uh, NATO can give uh, Ukraine, because honestly speaking, it is reached the level of positional warfare. Now, as you know, the battle lines are drawn to yeah. the extent that there is extensive fortification of the lines. Yeah. There are what's called the dragon's teeth uh, defenses that Russia has done. Three layers of uh, barbed wire trenches. Then before that, there is a foreground to that. In front of that, there is all the uh, uh, fortifications, only one part. It's also the kind of weapons they have deployed over there. Hmm. Mines which have been planted and they can actually lay mines very quickly. They have machines which can actually literally uh, lay mines in an hour or so across an empty area. So given all of that, the, none of these tanks or any of these things are going to work unless they really have large numbers of them. Now, the United States' ability to give Ukraine a large number of M1 Abraham tank, tanks itself is a question mark. And they've already bled their tank armies quite, uh, uh, what would be their stock quite a bit with the slightly older kind of uh, tanks they have given. But the main battle tank in large numbers is not something that uh, the United States, perhaps it is a, fortunately, is in a position to give. So I think, therefore, this is, in some sense, to keep up the morale of the Ukraine armed forces that we are still giving you something. You have hope. So there is now new uh, wonder weapons uh, going to come, which will allow you to punch again through their defense lines <clears throat> and so on. But it doesn't appear that these are really realistic propositions. And the real question, which a lot of people have raised, is what is the exit part from the war? And how do NATO and Russia get out of the war? Is a question to both sides. It's not that it's a one question to one side, yeah. but it has to appear to be something that both sides are willing to accept. And the basic thing is if they think, as 
the U European Union leadership, the United States leadership still says that Ukraine can win. Okay, not 2023, but I think somebody has said by 2025. So are we going to see another three years of this war in which Ukraine is a net, net sufferer, mm -hmm. as well as those areas under, of Russian-speaking areas which do not want to be with Ukraine anymore? So I think that is something the world has to address. And at the moment, there does not seem to be any sign of a reverse gear, so to say, in the United within the United States or the NATO. And part of it is also the domestic politics of the United States, where more or less the presidential cycle mm. also decides the foreign policy limits of the United States. We, which brings us to a major summit uh, where we are at the moment, uh, Prabir, in New Delhi, the G20 uh, heads of uh, government will meet over the next couple of days. Uh, anything on that stage? We've talked about it before on Debrief, but just for those who might have missed uh, that previous episode, uh, any sense there at this large meeting of world leaders uh, that there will be any dialogue, any discussion towards those exit plans that you were mentioning from this conflict? You know, that would mean a certain homework to be done before such a major change can take place. Hmm. Now, such a major uh, homework for, or homework to be done, it requires behind the scenes negotiations using other parties perhaps now, none of that seems, at least that we can see, is visible. Right. So what we have is rhetorical positions being taken by all sides in this. Russia has very clearly said peace in Ukraine is linked to expansion of NATO. So if Ukraine wants to join NATO, then we are all discussions are off the table. They gave their, their positions before the war itself. Peace treaty means settling eastward expansion of NATO and what is going to be the borders vivendi with Russia by the Western powers, including Western Europe, was mm. the question they had put on the table. So that was at the time completely poof pooed. And with the idea that Russia will be, if they attack, they'll be taught such a huge lesson yeah. that this will teach them never to do this again. Mm. Now, if defeat was the idea uh, which the, based on which they refused any discussion to Russia. Now it is clear that it is Russia was not such a weak power and yeah. they have financial and military strength beyond what the West or the NATO countries has estimated, particularly the idea that final economic sanctions will bring Russian economy to its knees That's and therefore true. the Russian yeah. government. So I think that from that impasse uh, impasse that we had, we haven't really proceeded any further. And we do not see any, any country who can negotiate between the two without a perception that, that there should be a peace agreement. Mm. If that understanding is not there, and there is a hope that we can win if we continue on this path, whichever yeah. side, then there is very unlikely that anybody can then do uh, what would be called, you know, honest interlocutor in, in this uh, scenario. So I think that is still, to me, still the impasse that we have, that there is no meeting ground that we can see at the moment. And therefore, a G20 has very little room to bring people together and say, okay, certain things should be done. And even the grain agreement, the fertilizer agreement, yeah. what is called the Black Sea agreement, that didn't go anywhere because the US and the European allies, its European allies, refused to withdraw the financial sanctions for at least fertilizers and grain. And though US and others keep on talking about how 53% or 54% went to uh, developing countries, yeah. the point is it went to rich developing countries. And that unfortunately includes China as well. Okay, and so it wasn't that it went to Africa or it went to those countries, even in Asia, which are poor. Yeah. So essentially, if we look at poor countries, they received something like 3% of the food grains that were exported. And Russian grains were actually could not be exported to those countries because ships were not available. 
financial transaction couldn't take place through the SWIFT account. This is mm. what the US and the European Union had promised and that they did not deliver. And uh, without that, the, for the poorer countries to pay for that was very difficult. And therefore, Russia said, well, we will give whatever we can free at the moment because you can't pay for it, given the kind of uh, financial problems that is there to negotiate on this. And there has been no resolution to the financial issue. In fact, the last that we heard was that Russia should create a new bank just per only for this purpose, special purpose, yeah. because they do not want to withdraw sanctions on any other bank. So the impasse is, again, on the grain trade also remains. And as you know, grains and fertilizers, food grains and fertilizers are the key for a lot of the world countries which are facing hunger, particularly Africa, Asia, not so much Latin America, perhaps, but certainly Asia, Asia and particularly Africa. So that problem still, unfortunately, is not has not been resolved. And we don't see any movement on that side either. Maybe that is a possibility that mm. could could perhaps be done in G20. Because G20 was primarily looked upon as an economic uh, gathering. It exactly. wasn't supposed to look at geopolitics, geopolitics, which is where the United Nations is supposed to play a role. Mm. It's the G7 mm. saying, we are the arbiters of the world. We de decide the global rules. The rule-based international order doesn't seem to be based on any international law. Mm. Uh, but all of this has detracted from the issue that the real issue of G20 is economics. And unfortunately on that, whether it's the World Trade Organization, whether it's any other platform, it's all deadlock because all those, all those instruments assume there is a functional economic system in the world, yeah. which actually is at, at the moment rupturing. And it's rupturing because of the kind of sanctions and also the kind of uh, various, what shall we say, uh, rules that the US is unilaterally imposing. And of mm. course, one part of which is the chip war, which mm. means that the basic glue holding the global trade together, together which yeah. is the World Trade Organization is no longer functioning. Mm. And the appellate body over there, which we have discussed, has, is no longer functional. And therefore, WTO has become a, a body which now does not resolve, is not able to resolve any issue. And the United States is very clear. It doesn't want WTO rules anymore. And I think that's where also G20 could perhaps play a role, but given the fact that the United States and some of the NATO allies are coming, but Russia and China is not, again, mm. it doesn't look like that kind of homework which could bring some dividend, it will actually take place or has taken place. And it is not India, uh, India's fault in this. I think it's that other countries have to accept that we would like to go back to something which existed earlier and not go on this path of collision. Because mm. if you go on a path of more sanctions on China, on the tech wars that we see, more sanctions on Russia that we see, then of course it will go the Iran route, that these countries will have to work out their alternatives. And countries like India are aligned to all sides. This is what yeah. Mr. Jayashan says, we, are, we have multiple alignments. We are aligned to Russia, because of our military ties. We are aligned to United States because of the uh, Quad uh, Asian, Indian Ocean, Indo-Pacific issues. And China is still our biggest trade partner. So multiple alignments is okay. A lot of countries in the world will have multiple alignments. Yeah. That's the way the world seems to be going. But ultimately the actors have to resolve these issues and we can only play, any other country, including India, can only play a limited role, provided there is a willingness to think about how this will be handled. We don't see that space still is opening at the moment. We'll be very pleasantly surprised if India yeah. can pull something out yeah. of the hat yeah. and see whether we get something which is more concrete than what the Bali Declaration was. Had to say. Right. Uh... With, on that uh, hopeful note, uh, however far-fetched it might be, uh, Prabir, uh, thank you for joining us on Daily Debrief today. And China and Australia are engaging in high-level dialogue in Beijing in meetings focusing on trade,
people to people contact and of course security. The dialogue began on Thursday in Beijing, the Chinese capital. The Australian side is led by former trade minister Craig Emerson, while the senior Chinese delegate is former foreign minister Li Zhaojing. Despite uh, doing well over 200 billion US dollars in trade every year, relations between China and Australia are at a low ever since the COVID-19 pandemic, with disagreements ranging from trade bans to, of course, the AUK-US AUK alliance and Australia's backing of the US's policy of military encirclement of China. Anish has been tracking the early meetings taking place in Beijing. We go over to him now for an update. Anish, how is uh, the mood on the beginning uh, day of this dialogue that is now resuming between the two countries? Uh, is there hope that, you know, it, things will get a little bit easier, at least in terms of how uh, d deals are done or deals are structured or negotiations take place? Yes, Sivan. So, uh, when we look at uh, the relations that Australia and China have had, like common tensions, uh, that they have had over the past couple of years is something that needs to be mentioned. Uh, one of the issues that obviously came up uh, during uh, the Scott Morrison government and, you know, kind of continued under the current Albanese government uh, is primarily the fact that Australia has uh, taken a significant step uh, towards uh, a very cruel U.S. Uh, foreign policy uh, foreign policy framework in the Indo-Pacific, and it has is essentially uh, tried to become the lever of uh, s uh, several of U.S. foreign policy uh, uh, objectives in the region as well, and that has been a bigger, uh, you know, a point of conflict uh, between the two countries. Especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw uh, Australian government at the Scott Morrison at times. Uh, making statements that, uh, about the, you know, about this whole COVID origin theory that uh, was without any basis and any kind of substantial evidence to begin with. But nevertheless, uh, they favoured that same line that Trump had given and pretty much uh, that created a bigger uh, conflict between, a bigger uh, gap between these two countries. Uh, but one of the uh, things that Australians have not forgotten, especially its government and its uh, ruling classes, is the fact that uh, China is their biggest trading partner. That cannot be uh, so, uh, that cannot be completely overlooked. Uh, it still needs uh, the Chinese economy, the market, uh, to sell a large number of its goods, and it pretty much just uh, you know depends on them for a big a big share of their. Uh, international trade. And so uh, something of that sort uh, cannot be replaced by any other country, no matter how close a deal or ideological uh, starting they might have. This is These are very real facts, and that is something that the Australian government cannot really overlook, uh, despite, uh, you know, surfaces governments taking a stand that pretty much antagonizes the Chinese government. So the mood right now is pretty much, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite tense. It's not bad, but it's tense nevertheless, because you have seen recently, especially the past stuff of Trump, uh, Australia pretty much uh, jumping into uh, issues of contention that it has no stakes in, uh, especially the South China Sea with, uh, you know, joint military drills uh, uh, with Philippines, or for that matter, uh, in, the, in the Pacific region, where, uh, where, you know, it has been trying to uh, strike uh, security deals with smaller uh, Pacific Island nations. And that has also uh, been a matter. And oh, very often such deals were made, you know, antagonizing China. So pretty much uh, it has had played this role of trying to antagonize China. And that has really come to backfire. And it really wants to make sure that the damage isn't too big for uh, it to not be able to reverse it in the near future. Right, Anish. Uh Australia and China are, of course, two of the major economies involved in the uh, Indo-Pacific region, uh, which is also sort of a, st uh, a strategic or military uh, potential flashpoint. And the U.S.'s involvement in the region uh, can never really be undermined. How does AUK, U.S. and Quad and all of that uh, come into focus when you, they talk of security at uh, conferences or dialogues like these? Then we have to wait and see what the impact will be on the Indo-Pacific because 
Uh, it is, uh, we have to remember that both countries have very different aims and objectives when it comes to how they want to deal with the Indo-Pacific region and uh, obviously their neighborhood, is, both of their neighborhood uh, to begin with. Uh, in the case of Australia, we have seen recently uh, it taking a very proactive measure to, uh, to sign, you know, defense agreements or security agreements with its uh, neighboring Pacific Arctic nations. And that has really shaped China, not because uh, it is trying to form flows of bonds with its neighborhood, uh, but the problem is that it, uh, most of these agreements very often come after significant, uh, as much rhetoric against China and very clearly is aimed against China and very uh, and pretty much, uh, you know, is uh, comes with an objective to prevent these island nations from actually having a similar kind of deal with China itself. So that has been the big problem. We're seeing uh, that kind of play out recently with the Vanuatu uh, political crisis right now with the new prime minister talking about uh, withdrawing from a security pact with Australia. Uh, and al already we are seeing uh, a large part of the Australian media, the media talking about how this is because of China influence when there is no talk right now at the very least from the, uh, from the Vanuatu government to actually uh, make any kind of security deals with China, but they do not want the Australian troops to stay in their island. And that is something that is going to play out for a very long time. And I, I really doubt, and most people at least really doubt, uh, whether this kind of talks, uh, which are going to be just mostly about bilateral relations, will actually deal with anything on these matters. And um, that is uh, that that would require a significant, a, a different kind of uh, diplomacy and bilateral uh, talks. That is not something that we see at the horizon for these two countries right now. Right. Thanks very much for that update, Anish. That's a wrap on this episode of the Daily Debrief. As always, we invite you to head to our website, peoplesdispatch.org, for more details on these stories and all of the other work we do. Don't also forget to share this video with your friends if you liked what you saw and follow us on the social media platform of your choice. We'll be back with another episode, same time, same place tomorrow. Until then, thank you for watching. Goodbye.